uh, I'm glad that you guys are all here uh, to see us in the afternoon. Uh, what I am uh, showing this afternoon is some of the tricks I use. Uh, uh, normally what I do, a typical project for me will be 10,000 wells in a great big 3D, but unfortunately I don't have permission to show the big 3D. So what I have is the Blackfoot uh, data set. Uh, and if you go out and you want to see the data set uh, past this particular uh, uh, a showing you can go to YouTube and put Blackfoot and Cruise and you'll find I posted my first YouTube movie and this data you'll see in the living color out there. What we're going to start off with this morning we actually loaded the data set and we've eliminated data loading uh, as an issue and the way Sizeware does that is there's a keyword file and all you have to insist if you're a geologist you say hey where's the keyword file and you just press a button for auto loading that's all been done. Uh, the other neat thing that we did this morning is uh, frequently we have from problems with tops and sometimes you have to wait for your uh, geologist to come back and uh, update the tops and but uh, you can right click on the map on your well that's in question where there's a bullseye and we did this this morning and within uh, three or four seconds a geoscode opens up with that well ticket and we can check and do things. So Sizeware is now seamlessly integrated with Geoscout. Uh, we're also integrated with our seismic processor. I've been using, well, uh, 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 CNC, but I can right click and go in and look at things like gathers. So it is a really neat feature that Sizeware, they can interface with any one of your vendors. I think the Geoscout is probably the key one. Uh, so if we start off with this uh, particular data set, uh, this morning we looked at um, the synthetics and loaded the data Data. We have one really good well tie, which is where Andrew's going. I look at this as sort of like an OCS sail, and what you would do is pick the well you're going to start from in the deepest part of the basin and go out in all directions as far as you can. In this case, we're picking the Pakisco very rapidly, so I would go, it's a nice easy pick, uh, so you probably auto picker would work, but this technique works particularly well where you get crappy data, where you really can't see the, the top of the Montney, for example, in, the, in some parts of uh, uh, of the area. After you've gone out from this one radial, we can do a series and a fairly coarse grid of every 20 inlines and cross lines. You can see the yellow ticks, so it's very rapidly we're going to pick the Pakisco. So this is the base of the package. We're looking at a play that's basically the Manville interval. There's a whole series of uh, the lithic sand packages. At the very base of, the, uh, of this package, there's a nice little block channel, uh, which this morning we went in and there's two brown lines in the map. We copied from a raster. We sort of si snitched the channel edges out of a publication uh, from U of C and we've put it on the map. Uh, we know that uh, in Canada's drilled from this channel, drilled this well out to the west. They didn't find the channel. And the question uh, I have is, what's going to happen uh, when you go up dip or go to the right? Do you think the channel uh, might extend to the right? Uh, I like looking at crossovers. I find my engineers seem to love things when it crosses over. We say that's good. And when it crosses back the other way, that's bad. So I think it's uh, uh, we're going to look at some of these amplitudes in detail. Uh, we're starting, uh, we've gridded the surface. I find the gridding is a really nice way to take a look at this geologically reasonable. Uh, on this map, the highs are the uh, yellows and the reds, and it's saying, okay, and it gets uh, deeper to the west. Uh, if you see bullseyes and if your seismic jumps legs, you start to see problems. And when you do a grid to horizon, so we can every 10 lines or every line in this case is what we'll do. We'll take the grid, put it on a horizon, and then we're going to go in and snap it to the polygon that we have, because that's where the seismic data exists, and extract the uh, amplitude. Now it's quite smooth, so we have to do the step to get it within a few mils, we say uh, snap the amplitude. And I'll do this, I'll take a uh, big 3D, uh, that's a township or two townships, and in less than a day I can pick all the major sequences that I'm going to use for depth conversion. The very last step of this uh, the, uh, the presentation is a, a depth conversion. I use size wear to convert from time to depth, and we'll pick a horizontal uh, a well location as we start to see the, the project come together. Uh, when we have this uh, amplitudes, we know that the peak and if we take a look, we have a hot spot. And the hot spot is up dip from our oil wells. This is the initial three months uh, production. Uh, you plot that, you make bubble maps in size where using criteria. It's not real obvious, uh, but criteria is a place you can go in and you get the, the production from Geoscout, bring it over here, plot her up, 
Uh, so we've got a total uh, cum gas and cum oil, and I did the whole Cretaceous package, so most of the wells have got some gas production. So the big question is, do we have any more uh, the, the, the liquids at this point? We know we have a higher amplitude as we go to the east. And we say, well, why do we have a higher amplitude? It's probably a contrast. Well, let's take a look at the trough that's above it, because the trough is fairly close to the top of this Ostracad package. Let's see what happens to that amplitude. Very simple to do. We come in from the Petisco. We'll now snap up. Uh, we'll use a measuring tool uh, so we can measure areas. So you can tell how size. Uh, we can measure a distance. Uh, here we measured about 12 mils up. And then we'll do a snap window to the trough, which is the wiggles go to the left. Uh, they're the red pick. So we'll do that, generate the amplitudes, and then we're going to make a cross plot and see if we have anything of interest. Now we'll bring up a seismic line, and I suggest the seismic line. Let's move down to where we have the oil well and the dry hole that was done by the previous geologist. But to go in and see the amplitude, and we can graph a curve of that amplitude. Uh, and change the color of one of them. Just a second. So a nice thing here is we can go in and plot the amplitude of the trough and the peak and see what happens. I've actually used this for the doig. Uh, and then this is, uh, I take a look and is quite interesting. Uh, the deviated well to the west, if we take a look, the amplitude of the trough and the peak are both quite low, so they're together. And all of a sudden, the amplitude of the red, which is the Pakisco underneath, ramps right up and is high, and the trough yeah, it's still pretty hot. It's about the same. And then all of a sudden, there's a real change at the end. So I look at this pattern, and I've done this on every porosity play that I've done in about the last five years, and saying, hey, I think there's a good chance the channel's really over there. But I know it's seismically, there's a much stronger trough, stronger peak. Uh, and that's where I put the channel. And then I said, what happens over here? I said, oh, that's probably, I've gone from 18% uh, the, the, uh, porosity in the channel, and it's not quite as good, but it's probably charged with uh, oil, because it's the crappier, volithic part of the manville that we're looking at. So I'm just intrigued on just looking at the amplitude of the, uh, uh, of the trough in the peak. Now we'll go in, so can we look at the amplitude of that trough on the, on the right hand side? So we'll look at it in map view. And it's slightly different, but we can also see we get a higher amplitude as we go to the east. In this case, the trough amplitude, if you notice, why did they drill here? They drilled here because the amplitude of the trough looks the same as the amplitude where the channel is. So if you only look at the trough, that's the logical thing to do. That's why they drilled there. But I'd say there's also the trough amplitude as we go, uh, go to the right. The advantage going east is we also have a high peak amplitude. So it suggests that maybe there is an additional channel. If you did the volumetrics, you could follow up and see is there a, a, a enough space to do things. We've pre-done about uh, 30 attributes. These are attributes uh, generated from the University of Oklahoma, Kurt Montfort's attributes. Uh, Sizeware has a whole bunch of attributes. And you can look, I've looked at all of those, but I found that Kurt Montfort's, they take about 10 times longer to run, uh, but there seems to be more resolution. So I would certainly encourage anyone to go out and, and compare as many attributes as you can. In this case, we're looking at a, a pattern which is the most positive curvature. And as we go down, and I like looking at them in time slices, because if I see an attribute and it changes pattern very abruptly in one sample, I said, there's something wrong. It's the math, it's just a math pattern. But if I take a look, and as we go down through the Cretaceous package, I start to see an alignment. The original channel are the two brown lines, and I'm postulating that maybe the channel, there's some channel facies that's just to the east. Uh, the only unusual thing I see, uh, there's somewhat higher curvature, and I'm guessing there's two wells here, and we'll check a little bit later an air photograph and say, is there a pad, and could we run a north-south horizontal, as I'm leaning up to. Uh, so one well that would come here, and then another one to check out the lithic facies. If we get good oil out of here, well, what's going to come up with a horizontal that's a little bit up depth? So I see some very interesting patterns. What do they really mean? I'm not really sure. But the nice thing about curvature is it, it doesn't have to be a high amplitude. Curvature of a weak event has as much information as a strong event. So it's a pattern that's in the data and may be suggestive of some fracturing uh, or uh, risk for the drilling.
There's a nice little tool going in from time to depth that Sizeware has, and we've preloaded the Viking, and you just do uh, what is my horizon, it maps to what top, and then you just press the run button, and it will actually convert time to depth. There's a last step it does, and uh, Sizeware converts it to depth, ties all the wells within a meter. So when I deliver a depth product, it ties every well within a meter, it's forced to do that. Uh, I found by experience we're typically plus or minus three meters. Occasionally I've had a seven meter error and the biggest error I've had in the last four years of doing this has been nine meters. And that's one well out of about 50 horizontals that I've actually drilled. Here we have uh, the error photograph. This is courtesy Voltus actually owns the data and said we could use it. And we notice we've got a great big pad location up there and I say hey that looks pretty good. So that's where we can put the surface. So let's go and draw ourselves a profile we'd like to do of a horizontal. We'll stay about 200 meters away from the boundary because of the spacing unit issues that you have. Uh, so that's where the idea, let's see how it looks in seismic. And we had pre-saved some parameters to look at size. And now we have things in sub-C and we've expanded it up. So now uh, the geologists uh, uh, can comprehend a little bit more what is a seismic plot. So this is a seismic line right along the trajectory. And what Andrew is going to do is click and make a profile and say, okay, where do we want the heel? Where do we want the toe? Uh, oh, the other thing we should do is put the amplitude for the horizons. Uh, and we can actually mix units here. We can put the amplitude from the time horizons and yet we're dealing on the depth section. But we just want to see the amplitudes of the event. Uh, and if you look at that, we said, okay, we want to schmuck the sweet spot. Where is the sweet spot? And, and the sweet spot, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, is the zero crossing. Um, if you work for a company like Amico, what they would do uh, when in, in, in the Doig prospect, they would uh, rotate, do a poor man's inversion, which is rotate 90 degrees. So that makes the zero crossing the, where the maximum event is. And you'd have one amplitude, which is the sum of both of them. So you come along, you tell your geologist, you're uh, uh, coming in just before the sand, we're going to set the direction of the pipe. We come out of casing, and it's going to get better uh, just by the time we're all set to go into the formation. By the time we get to this point, uh, we probably out of the channel facies, and it's going to be into more of the lithic part of the manville as we go up depth. Uh, on the right hand side we can just file save that as a series where all measure depth TVDs, you send those numbers off to the driller and they can make the real profile that's going to go in and test our channel feces um, where the cross section. There's one last thing that we need to take a look at. We've also have looked at all our gathers as muthally and we've computed some dip vectors looking at variations of normal move out by angle. And we have a couple of ways of doing this and when we display the vectors which just come in as a culture layer, what we can see is uh, about where the heel is, we're going to have so, a little bit of higher stress. Uh, regionally these are the uh, uh, maximum stress direction about 40 40 degrees, which is typical, I think, for the province. Uh, and we can see we've got a low stress uh, environment for most of those vectors. Uh, examples in the Barnett Shale have indicated that low stress, you probably have more productive wells, fracks reach uh, farther out into the section. Uh, so these are good things. So we've combined, we have a depth profile, uh, we've looked at the azimuthal vectors, uh, we've looked at the amplitudes from a crossover, we've looked at some curvature, so we've put a whole bunch of different attributes together to come up with a prospect. And the final step is to come up and, well, how much oil do we think is here? And now we've got some geologists, so they'll probably challenge me on my numbers, but I went up and said, okay, let's put in a porosity of 15%, uh, um, uh, water saturation uh, 40%, uh, formation volume 1.4 is my favorite number, I don't know why. Uh, and if we take a look at the recovery factor, uh, say 20%, 30%, and we get about 300,000 barrels, I think, or 200,000 in this case of the numbers. So it's just real easy, just quick and dirty. Uh, the oil case is quite simple. Uh, and uh, what we did was clicked on, there's a polygon here. So this is where we think we're probably going to frack out into. So that gives you an indication of what you think the reserves for that particular well path is going to be. And you could do the same thing. Let's go up dip. Uh, for the lithic section here, the porosity you drop way down, but you've probably got uh, more oil in the section. 
Uh, so this is sort of a quick way of looking, evaluating a 3D with a uh, sizeware, a whole bunch of the tools, working in depth, uh, looking at azimuth. Uh, this amplitude plot is one of the takeaways uh, this morning that most people have. It's just nice to see the amplitude of the trough over the peak, which is the interface that you're looking at. And the engineers seem to love this cross the, the crossover point. So uh, I want to thank you all for coming here. and. Uh, if you've got any questions, I'll certainly be around.